Okay, so we're recording, and this is the second class. Uh, this is Thursday. Uh, Thursday. Uh, where are we? January 20th. All right, so let me take us to where I can do attendance. Back to here. All right. Attendance. All right, Nevea Arnold. Are you out there, Nevea? Not yet. Cindy Babel? Here. Yeah. Okay. Jacob Blackburn? Jacob? Matt Castles? Here. Yeah. Okay. Grace Sickey? Here. Madeline De Palma? Here. Yeah. Okay. Josh Grigoletti? Here. Yeah. Okay, Jeremy Groves. Here. Okay, Travis Harvey. Here. Sydney Hips. Sydney. Seyun Huang. Here. All right, Kayla Jewell. Here. Christian Kemp. Here. Yuta Koike. Here. Destiny Merriweather. Here. Okay, Jeremy Meyer. Here. Brock Newsom. Here. Anthony Phillips. Here. Helen Phillips. Haley Phillips, excuse me. Here. Uh, Jacob Smeltzer. Here. Walter Tolliver. Walter? No. Uh, Hallie Vogt. Here. Autumn Wanchuk. Here. Mae Williams. Here. Okay. And Ashley Walford. Here. All right. Welcome, everybody. All right, let's get back to here. All right, nobody's waiting in the waiting room. That's good. Let me get this to full screen so I can do what I'm trying to do. All right, so um, real quick, what I want to do is to show you the outline for today. You guys should have uh, access to this on Moodle. Here's what we're gonna look at today. Uh, study guide for chapter 28, transfers of negotiable instruments and warranties of the parties. Uh, definition of negotiation, process of negotiation, bearer paper versus order paper. Uh, types of endorsements. And notice I spelled that with an I. This is an endorsement, not an endorsement. Uh, blank, special, qualified, restrictive, uh, correction of name, uh, multiple payees, which is and or or, and agent or office holder. Forged. What happens if we have a forged endorsement? Lost instruments, if it's bearer paper or order paper, it will make a difference. And warranties, all, all signatures are authorized. Instrument has not been altered. Instrument not subject to defense or claim. Drawer has authorized the issuance of the instrument. Uh, warrantor has no knowledge of bankruptcy of maker or acceptor. Not warranted, no guarantee that the payment will be made. Now, when we talk about warranties, uh, in the law, um, the, you, the, the usage of the word that you're used to would be you buy a product and you get a warranty with it. You buy a, a new car, you get a three years for 36,000 mile warranty or whatever. And basically what that is, is the manufacturer guaranteeing that the, uh, uh, that the product that they're selling you is going to work, that there are not problems with it. And um, Basically, it's the same thing in the law, although we're not warranting a, uh, an item, a product, we're, I, we're warranting a transaction or a piece of paper, a document. And that's what we're doing here when we talk about warranting um, our negotiable instruments. So let me stop sharing. And let me get up on my, here, my book. All right. All right, so um, definition of negotiation. Okay, so what is negotiation? That's our first question here. All right, so definition of negotiation means a transfer of possession of an instrument by a person other than the issuer to a person who thereby becomes a holder. Okay, so the maker of the of the document, the drawer or the maker, depending on whether it's it's an order to pay or a promise to pay, 
will give that document to somebody else, a second party. So let's assume once again that we're doing checks here. So I write out a check and I hand it to one of you. Uh, that is not negotiation. That's my issuing of the, uh, the original document to you. But should you take it and try to have it uh, uh, to, to, to transfer it to somebody else uh, for the value that the document represents, that's negotiation. A transfer of possession of an instrument by a person other than the issuer to a person who thereby becomes the holder. Now, holder is an important concept here. Okay, Walter's coming in, to let him in. Being a holder is an important thing. A holder is someone in possession of an instrument that runs to the person. That is, it's made payable to that person, is endorsed to that person, or is bearer paper. So a holder is somebody who has possession of the document, the negotiable instrument, and it is a legal possession meaning I give the check to one of you. And uh, the example that I gave last class is you go back home for spring break, carrying that check from me. And you want to uh, uh, say that I wrote you a check for $100 for some reason. And you go home and uh, you don't have time to go to the bank and you need the cash. So you go to your, your mother or your father and you say, hey, you got this check from, uh, from my professor. Uh, I don't have a chance to go to the bank, but I need the money. I'm going out tonight and I, I, I'd like to have the cash. So your mother says, ah, no problem. Just uh, here, give me the check and I'll give you $100. So she reaches into her purse and gives you 520s and you give her the document. Now, what the definition of holder said is someone in possession of an interest instrument that runs to the person runs to the person means it's made payable to that person is endorsed to that person or is bearer paper so i write the check to sally smith sally smith takes it home and gives it to her mother ann smith now just handing that check to her mother is not going to turn her mother into a holder and it really hasn't been negotiated because the check is still made payable to the order of Sally. So when Sally gives it to her mother, Anne, Sally needs to endorse the check over, endorse the negotiable instrument, over to her mother. So on the back, Sally has a number of choices. Now, I'm sure you've all signed a check so that you could cash a check in the past. You flip it over and one side of it says uh, that you're, there's a box there that asks you to do all endorsements on that side of the check. And that's fine. In that box, Sally would have to endorse the check because at this point, it's only payable to her or her order. So she can now negotiate it because it's it's a negotiable instrument because it's paid to the order of Sally Smith. For it to become the property of Ann Smith, for it to be properly negotiated to Ann Smith, Sally has to endorse the back. Now, she can just sign the back of it if she wants, Sally Smith, and then hand it to her mother. That's proper. That's okay. And that's what most people would do. Um, one of the things we're going to find out a couple of pages into the chapter here is that <clears throat> that's what's called a blank endorsement. Now, on the front of the, of the check, on the front of the negotiable instrument, we have that the check is payable to the order of Sally Smith. So that means it is order paper. It is made payable to a specific person or their order. And I told you last class, that is a, a security feature. You know, if Sally were to lose the check, nobody else would be allowed to cash it. I didn't make the check payable to bearer or to cash. That would have made it bearer paper, meaning that anybody in possession would be allowed to negotiate it. So when Sally takes that check made to payable to the order of Sally Smith, she flips it over and signs the back, Sally Smith. That's a proper endorsement. However, she has now changed it from order paper to bearer paper. 
because see, the requirement on the front was that it be endorsed by Sally Smith. When she endorsed it on the back, she completed that requirement that was on the front. So by signing the back the way that she did, it turned it into bearer paper. If her mother, Ann, loses that check, it is as, as if she dropped $100 on the ground. Anybody that picks it up would have the ability to negotiate it because the blank signature, Aunt, uh, Sally Smith just signing, Sally Smith on the back, turned it into bearer paper. Okay, so that's a little bit of a problem. And we're going to see that we have the ability to, to change that as we move down the line. All right, so one of the things that I said was that we, uh, uh, when we negotiate the paper to somebody, that new person becomes a holder. And that's a very specific uh, title in the world of negotiable instruments. So a holder, once again, is somebody that has had it negotiated to them. Now, beyond that, you can, you can try to get to another level of, uh, another level of uh, ability here, and that is a holder in due course. That's somebody who is, has superior rights to just a plain old holder. A holder in due course is a holder who has given value, taken the document in good faith without notice of dishonor, defense, or the instrument is overdue, and who is afforded special rights or status. All right, so the holder in due course uh, status is not hard to get. Um, and what you have to do is you have to look at the fact that when we're, 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 the area of law that we're in is an area of law that is trying to make the flow of commerce easier. We're trying to create documents that in themselves represent value so that we don't have to carry around wheelbarrows full of cash we can have these other pieces of paper, these other documents actually represent the value of that money. A check represents the value of money that I have in a bank account at a particular bank, okay? So the whole idea here is to make this flow through the economy, through the commerce, much quicker and easier. So a holder in due course if you can think through how we've done, you know, over the past uh, six months, going back to the prior, you know, the B law one, there's a lot of things that we saw in the law that we would protect people as we went through the system, because protecting, for example, the protecting of a, uh, a bona fide purchaser for value gave confidence in the system. That way, we didn't have to stop and check every transaction. We had confidence that if we went to Walmart and paid for the uh, for the doc, the item, that it would be ours. We were a bona fide purchaser for value, so therefore, we were protected. Same thing's going to occur here with the holder in due course uh, situation. The holder in due course is going to be a holder, but he's going to have superior rights, mostly because we want to protect that person. Protecting the holder in due course is part of making sure that people have confidence in the, um, in the payment system. Give me a second here. All right, so let me move forward here. So as I, as I was saying, to become a holder in due course, if you looked at those requirements, they weren't terribly uh, oppressive uh, things that you needed to do. Let me get back to the right page of my book here. To be a holder in due course, once again, has given value. Okay, so let's go back to my situation with Sally Smith and her mother, Ann Smith. Does Ann Smith give value to Sally for the check? Yeah, Sally said, Mom, I'd, I'd, I'd like to give you this check if you give me the $100 for it. So her mother gives her the $100. The check is in the amount of $100. Mom gives her $100. Did she give value? Absolutely. 
she took did she take it in good faith without notice of dishonor or defense or that the instrument was overdue well there was no indication that the check had been rejected by the bank right we have no knowledge that there's the check is going to be bad we don't have any dishonor there's no defenses against the check there's no, nobody out there saying hey that was forged or anything like that and it's not overdue because the check is fresh later on we'll talk about how you lose freshness on a check um so uh, and smith has met the first two requirements, took it, uh, she gave value, she took it in good faith without notice of any kind of problems with it. Um, so therefore, and, and, and she doesn't know, she knows that it's not overdue. So she is a holder in due course. So mom will be a holder in due course. Okay, so I had talked about um, on the uh, on the outline said that the thing we wanted to talk about was the process of negotiation bearer paper versus order paper. Now bearer paper, as I said, means that it is negotiable by whoever is holding it. You know, it's whoever has it in their possession. In theory, nobody has to endorse it. So if I write a check to cash, that is bearer paper or if I wrote the check to bearer, that's bearer paper. The negotiation happens purely by delivery. No endorsement is actually necessary. So if I wrote a check to cash and gave it to Sally Smith, and then Sally Smith went back home over spring break, gave the check to her mother, she would not even need to endorse the back of it because it's bearer paper. Bearer means whoever is in possession of it. So once Sally gave the check to her mother, and that was delivery. That delivery completely accomplished the negotiation. Okay, so it's very simple to do a negotiation on bearer paper. Now, order paper is different. Order paper, as I said before, you have a condition on the front. Check payable to the order of Sally Smith. So that check can only be negotiated by Sally Smith at this moment. She can negotiate it, but she, that's a security feature, if you will, that she's the one who has to take the steps to negotiate it. Okay, so it's made payable to a specific party or their order. And that means in order for it to be negotiated, it needs to be endorsed. Now, keep in mind, I keep pointing out that this endorsement is spelled with an I, I-N-D-O-R-S-E-M-E-N-T, -E -E so endorsement. So you have two things that are required for negotiation of order paper. It has to be endorsed by the person who it's made payable to, and it has to be delivered to the holder. Okay, so if I make the check payable to the order of Sally Smith in the amount of $100, when she goes and wants to negotiate it to her mother, she would then have to sign the back of it. Okay, now we'll talk about the endorsements now. A blank endorsement is an endorsement that does not name the person to whom the paper, document of title, or investment security is negotiated to. Okay, so Sally Smith signs the back of the check and then hands it to her mother. That's a proper endorsement. It is fine, but it's called a blank endorsement. The blank endorsement does not indicate the person to whom the instrument is being negotiated to, the transferee. A blank endorsement turns order paper into bearer paper. So like I said, if Sally Smith signs the back of that check, and then that check is lost, it is bearer paper and can be negotiated by whoever finds it. Now, some of you, I, I don't know if any of you have worked in the banking industry and you're going to be telling me that there's a lot of what I'm saying is wrong, but I'm gonna come back around to that because banks do things different than what the law actually requires. Okay, so that's a blank endorsement. All you do is sign your name, okay? The next one that's out there is something called a special endorsement. This is an endorsement that specifies the person to whom the instrument is being endorsed to. Okay. So for example, Sally Smith, if she writes on the back of the check uh, for her endorsement, pay to the order of Ann Smith, her mother. 
Okay, that's who she's negotiating the document to. So she would say, pay to the order of Ann Smith and then signs her name. Okay, now her signature is the endorsement, but the extra language that she put on the back of the check has made it a special endorsement. A special endorsement names the person you're transferring the document to. That special endorsement keeps the document as order paper. Okay, so that's important. If that check was lost, it could only be in, it could only be negotiated by Ann Smith because that's how it was endorsed on the back. When Sally Smith endorsed it, she put a condition out there. Let me see. I bet you I have people that are telling me they can't get in. Okay, not a problem. All right, so that's a special endorsement. Okay, so let's move on to the next kind. A qualified endorsement. A qualified endorsement is an endorsement that includes words such as without recourse and then your signature. Now, when we talk about recourse in the law, that means we're talking about your ability to um, sue somebody. So if I had recourse, if I was involved in a transaction and there was a breach, if it was a contract, there was a breach of contract, my recourse would be to sue the person who was in default. Okay. If I had loaned money to somebody and I had a promise, they had uh, they had given me a promissory note and they failed to pay me back, my recourse would be to sue them for breach uh, of uh, of the terms of the promissory note. Okay. If you sign the back of a check, the back of an, a of a, uh, a negotiable instrument without recourse. That means that you are not, as the endorsee, as the payee, you are not taking any responsibility for whether or not the, the uh, instrument will ever be honored. Will it be cashed when it gets back to my bank? That's your question. Well, um, good question. Um, you can do that. You can sign the back of it saying without, uh, without recourse. Um, just let me ask you this question. If, I, if you were to take a check that you signed without recourse on the back to your bank, would they want to take it? See, probably not. Because without recourse means you're taking no responsibility. When you sign the back, and we haven't gotten to this yet, but when you endorse the back, you're making all of the warranties that we're going to talk about, meaning, and one of them is you're guaranteeing that, that the uh, document is going to be able to be honored. OK, so if you're afraid of that and you want to sign the back of it without recourse, you have that right. All I'm saying is that in the real world, I don't know that anybody's going to accept that document. All right, let's move on to the next one, a restrictive endorsement. This is an endorsement that restricts further transfer. Um, so we can talk about how it's supposed to be endorsed next. So, for example, if you, did you ever notice that if you write a check to a business, um, that usually what's going to happen is the cashier is going to have some sort of a, uh, a way to mark the back of the check. Um, in the old days, there would be a rubber stamp next to the, ca uh, next to the cashier, and they would flip the check over, and in the place where it's supposed to be endorsed, they would stamp the check. And on that stamp, it would say, for deposit only, First National Bank in favor of Walmart or whoever it was that you, know, you wrote the check to. Okay, that's a restrictive endorsement. The most common one uh, that you'll see out there is for deposit only. Okay, so what that does is it is an endorsement by the person who has uh, that you've you you're, you've given the uh, the document to, and then they uh, they're restricting what can happen to it. So if they lose the check after they've endorsed it, it can only be deposited into their account. That's why that's like that. OK, so a restrictive endorsement is a, is a nice endorsement. And a lot of uh, a lot of businesses will require their people to ch to stamp the checks that way immediately because they don't want the employees stealing the money. 
All right. Moving back. All right. What about multiple payees and endorsements? Multiple payees. So you can have a check made payable to John Smith and Sally Smith, or you can have a check made payable to John Smith or Sally Smith. This is the and or situation. Okay. So this is an, it's very interesting how very little things can create protections for you. And I'll, I'll explain this this way. If I were to uh, settle a lawsuit, I'm, you know, say I have somebody who has a slip and fall, uh, they slipped on a banana peel at, uh, at Giant Eagle, and we had a lawsuit going against Giant Eagle, um, and we came up with a, a resolution. They decided to settle the lawsuit for $50,000. And they would give the check to me, the lawyer. Okay, they wouldn't give it to the to the client. They would give the check to me, and the check would be payable to John Gamalchak and Sally Smith, because see, the other side wants to make sure that when they pay off the debt, that everybody's rights are going to be protected. See. Sally Smith would owe me money for having represented her in the lawsuit. So if they made the check payable directly to her, I may not get paid. If they made the check payable purely to me, I might be a crooked lawyer and steal the money and never give the money to Sally Smith and they would still owe the money to Sally Smith. Okay, so they would then use the and designation to make sure that we had to cooperate between us to make sure that both of us got our share of that particular uh, check. Okay, so they would make it payable to and what that means is the endorsement on the back would require both of our signatures, John Skamalchak and Sally Smith, we would both have to sign the back of the check. If it's an or situation, you're doing it for convenience. My wife's name is Susan. So if my, if, uh, um, if my, uh, my brother was writing us a check uh, to, for some reason, and he didn't, you know, he didn't care which of us cashed a check, and he had no idea which of us does the banking, so he could make the check payable to John Gamalchak or Susan Gamalchak, okay? Now, that creates a convenience, not necessarily a protection, okay? because either one of us can endorse that check and negotiate it, okay? So if you use or, then only one of the signatures is required. If you use and for multiple payees, then both uh, of, the, uh, of the payees need to sign the, uh, or endorse on the back, okay? So that's the and or the or. Um, what about if you're an agent or an office holder? For example, if I want to pay my real estate taxes, they get paid to the city treasurer. You know, I live in uh, Mill Creek Township, so it would actually be to the, uh, the tax collector of uh, Mill Creek Township. Now, that person has a name. I think it's um, Sally Case or something like that. How do I write the check to pay my real estate taxes? Well, can I write the check it to be payable to the Mill Creek tax collector? Sure, because I'm paying to the person who holds that office, and that's fine. If I were to write the check payable to uh, Sally Case, I could do that, but I'm taking a little bit of a risk because I'm, I'm putting it in her personal name as opposed to uh, her, her office, you know, her position as tax collector. So in theory, if she was a, a, a crooked person, she could take that check and negotiate it for her own purposes and not pay my taxes. Um, I could make it payable to Sally Case, comma, Mill Creek tax collector, and then she would have to, uh, she would have to negotiate it in her proper position, okay? So there's ways of doing that. If you fail to, to endorse it, you have not negotiated it. All right, let me see what else, what's next on our thing here. Forged, 
All right. Um, I, I do want to go back just for a second. One of the things that I had said was that all of these rules about whether you have to, you know, for, so for example, one of the things I said is that if it's bearer paper, legally, you, you are not required to endorse it. However, if you were to take bearer paper, a check made payable to cash or a check made payable to bearer to a bank and try to cash it, I will guarantee you that they will not cash that check unless you sign it. And although that appears to be wrong under the rules that we're looking at here under uh, you know, Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code, the bankers are concerned with protecting their rights. OK, you have to look at it from this point of view. When we get to the end here and we look at look at the warranties, especially when you're talking about a check, somebody somewhere in that line is going to end up losing. If we have a long line of people who have negotiated a check somewhere in there, somebody's going to end up losing and they're going to end up having to pay the money. OK, so if it's a bad check and the money doesn't exist in my bank account somewhere, somebody in the middle is going to end up losing a hundred bucks. That's just the way it works. The bank doesn't want to be the one holding the bag here. They don't want to end up being the one who says, oh, yeah, I guess we should have been more careful. So let's say I write a check to bearer and I give it to A. A negotiates it to B. B negotiates it to C, negotiates it to D, who then takes it back to the bank to cash it. Now, under the rules, nobody in that line of negotiation needed to, act, to endorse it. It was all done by delivery uh, of possession solely, okay? Because that's how negotiation works with a bearer instrument. So when D takes that check back to my bank, the, they don't know D. So they're concerned that there might be a, uh, a problem with the check. Maybe it was stolen. Maybe it was, it was, uh, uh, maybe it was forged. Maybe you know, there might be some issues with it. So the bank is going to be concerned. They want to make sure that they have somebody else in, uh, in line to be responsible for that check. So they will require you to endorse the check, even though under Article 3, it's not required. The bank will, under its own rules, say, hey, you need to endorse this check because we want to make sure that we can have uh, recourse against somebody. So when D cashes the check at my bank, they will require that it be endorsed. Not something that's required under the Article 3 rules of the UCC, but the bank wants to make sure that there's somebody else's endorsement on there so they can go after somebody else. The other thing is, is I want to go back, you know, once again, just talking about the reality of the world versus what the law appears to say. Um, when I write that check to Sally Smith, and then she goes on spring break to some place, you know, far away, or far away. Um, and they don't know me, the, you know, the, my particular bank doesn't exist in that particular region. Uh, they have no knowledge of me. They have no confidence. They have no idea. So if Sally were to take my check and go to the bank where her mother does her banking, let's say Sally doesn't have a, an account at that bank, and she would say, I'd like to cash this check, please. They would say, fine, are you a depositor here? And she'd say, no, I'm not. They would look at my check, which is drawn on a different bank. They have no idea if there's any money in my account or not. And they would know that now that Sally does not have an account at that bank, they would refuse to cash the check. Is it illegal? Oh, my gosh, you can't do that. Yeah, they can because they're concerned because here's the problem. If they give the cash to Sally and she walks out the door and they never see her again, and then they put my check through the clearance system and it comes back that there's not money in my account. Then what happens is the bank is out the hundred dollars that they gave to Sally. They don't want that to happen. So when Sally came in and said, I want to cash this check and, and indicated she was not a depositor, the bank will refuse to cash the check because they won't have anybody to collect against if the check is bad. Now, change the situation. Sally is a depositor at that bank 
in California or wherever she's at. She walks into the bank and says, hey, I'd like to cash this check. Fine, are you a depositor? Yes, I am. Here's my account number. And they look at her account and they see that she has more than $100 in her account. They'll say, fine, we'll cash this, no problem. You know, hope you're having a nice day and they'll be very cheerful. You know, be very nice and happy and friendly. Because if my check bounces, if my check is dishonored, it goes through the payment system, it is dishonored, and it comes back to the bank, the bank's out the $100. But because Sally is a depositor and Sally got the $100, they would then just take the $100 out of Sally's account. Okay, the bank doesn't want to ever be in a position where they don't have recourse against somebody. Now go back to when I talked about an accommodation endorsement last class, Sally doesn't have an account at that bank. So she goes to the bank with her mother and Sally says, I'd like to cash this check. Are you a depositor? No, I'm not, but my mother is. So Sally endorses the check. Her mother endorses the check. That way the bank can hold the mother responsible if the check is dishonored. Okay, so those are very practical things that the bank does to make sure that it's never going to be the uh, entity that ends up losing here. So um, when you go into the bank and you see them act in a certain way, ask whether you're a depositor, you know, those types of things, that's what they're doing. They're just making sure that when you endorse the check, that you have the ability to guarantee or make those warranties actually valuable change the facts one last time. Sally is a depositor. She goes to that bank, says, I want to cash this check. And the bank looks at her account. The check is for $100 and Sally has $50. They will not cash the check, even though she's a depositor. Why? Because she doesn't have $100. If the check is dishonored, they want to get the $100 out of Sally's account. And if she doesn't have $100, the bank is not going to be made whole. They don't want to do that. Now, what can Sally do? She can deposit it into her account. She can take the $50 out that she has. And then the next day when the check is considered to be cleared, she can take the other $50 out. But those, these are the games that we play in the banking system to make sure well, the bank always wants to make sure that it is protected. All right, let's talk about forged instruments. All right, a forge or unauthorized endorsement. An instrument is endorsed by an agent for a principal without authorization or authority, uh, or if the person is actually forging a signature. Um, this is a very complicated area, I'll be very honest with you, because we have um, all kinds of different rules here. We have quasi forgeries, the imposter rule. Uh, this is an exception to the rule on liability for forgery that covers a situation such as embezzling or pay, of, of a payroll clerk or something like that. So if we have an imposter rule, um, provides three exceptions to the rule that forged endorsement is not effective to, uh, to validly negotiate an instrument. So the main rule, the overall rule is a, a forged endorsement or a forged signature uh, author, uh, authorizing the document itself. Um, the general rule is that a forged signature is never valid for negotiation purposes. Okay. However, there are exceptions to that. And those exceptions have to do with uh, in the business world, if somebody is just being stupid about it, you know, they don't want to protect people who are being stupid. Um, the imposter rule. Um, impersonating a payee. The impersonation of a payee in the imposter rule exception includes pers uh, impersonations of the agent of the person who was named a payee. For example, if Jones pretends to be the agent of Brown Corporation and thereby obtains a check payable to the order of the corporation, the imposter exception applies. The dummy payee and other imposter scenarios when the preparer of the instrument intends that the named payee will never benefit from the instrument, such a dummy payee may be an actual or fictitious person. This situation arises when the owner of a checking account wishes to conceal the true purpose of taking money from the account at the bank. The account owner makes out the check 
purportedly a payment of a debt that in fact it does not exist. So all of you that have done auditing, this is why you pay attention to the accounts payable department, because what happens is occasionally you'll have a, an accounts payable clerk that will create a fictitious vendor and then create fictitious uh, invoices and fictitious uh, per, uh, purchase orders and such as that. And they can start writing checks to this fictitious vendor and then pocketing the money. Um, that's considered to be a forgery. But if you as a company don't have controls in place to keep that from happening, then the bank says they shouldn't be responsible. You should be responsible because of the fact that you uh, don't have controls in place. Um, so those are some things that are out there. If you want to take a real good hard look at the imposter rule and, and such, go ahead and do that. I'm not going to test you on it because it is kind of an ex, uh, kind of extensive and uh, um, uh, confusing. So I'm not going to worry about it for tax for uh, for tax for uh, uh, test purposes. But it's out there. All right. Uh, what happens if you lose your document? Okay. So I think we've talked about this a little bit already. Um, if it's an order instrument, uh, if the lost instrument is order paper, the finder does not become the holder because it has not been endorsed and delivered properly, okay? So having it be order paper creates that condition on the front, which creates a bit of security for you. If that document is lost, it is not negotiable. Bearer instruments, if the lost instrument is bearer form, <coughs> excuse me, the finder, uh, is the possessor of the bearer instrument and therefore becomes the holder and is entitled to enforce the payments, okay? So once again, try not to lose the documents and try not to have anything that's really bearer in form, okay? All right, so we're going to talk about the warranties now, the warranties. All right, so when an instrument is transferred by negotiation, the transfers give certain implied warranties. When we talk about implied warranties, they're not express warranties. They're warranties that are out there because they were created by the law, okay? Um, when a transfer receives consideration for the endorsement and makes the unqualified endorsement, the warranties stated in this section are given by the transfer or by implication. No distinction is made between an unqualified blank endorsement and an unqualified special endorsement. Okay, so qualified, remember, was without recourse, which I said exists in the law, but the bank is not going to accept the check. So the rest of the uh, endorsements, all of the endorsements we talked about were unqualified endorsements. So that means that if you endorse the back of the check and then transfer it to another holder, then you have given these warranties, okay? Let me see here for a second. Okay. Number one, the warrantor is a person entitled to enforce the instrument. Okay, so keep in mind, this is not the maker of the instrument. This is somebody who is transferring or negotiating the instrument. Okay, the maker of the instrument is, <clears throat> is, is obligated under the terms of the instrument itself. So we're not talking about creating warranties in the, uh, in the maker, only in the people who are transferring. Once again, keep in mind, the whole purpose of this is to try and make it so that um, we have confidence in the payment system, okay? We want to make sure everybody is willing to accept the transfers of these documents because we want to make sure that the economy and, and, and commerce can move quickly. So if we had a failure or a lack of confidence in the payment system, that would create a real problem in doing business the way that we do in today's world, okay? So you are the transfer or you're transferring it to another holder, okay? Number one, the warrantor is a person entitled to enforce the instrument. That means you're a holder. You have the right to the instrument. You aren't a thief. You aren't a forger. No laws have been broken, okay? So you have the check. You have the negotiable instrument uh, for under proper reasons. You have every legal right 
to enforce the terms, to take it to the bank and cash it, so to speak. Okay. Number two, all signatures on the instrument are authentic and authorized. You as the transfer or are guaranteeing to the holder who you're giving it to that all of the signatures on the instrument are authentic and authorized. Think about that. Now, if you're Sally Smith and I'm writing you this check and I tell you, hey, Sally, come on into my office. Let me give you that check. And I pull out my checkbook out of the drawer of my desk and I write out the check in front of Sally and I sign it where I'm supposed to rip it out of my checkbook and give it to her. Okay. Is she going to be able to say in good faith and in good conscience? Yeah, I know that that's Kamal check signature. I saw him sign it. Certainly not a problem, but that's not always the case. You may not have seen me sign the check and even worse, we're getting into a situation where the check has been negotiated to holder after holder after holder. Nobody, they're using the check basically as the $100 bill. Nobody's bothered to go to the bank to get the money. Okay, so I give it to Sally, who gives it to Ann, who gives it to Frank, who gives it to George. Okay, so how many signatures do we have on there as endorsers on the back? We've got Sally, we've got Anna, we've got Frank. Now George is holding it. And if George wants to negotiate it, George will endorse the back, but he's giving these warranties. Is he a person entitled to enforce the, uh, the, the document? Yes. He is now going to, by negotiating it, he is going to make a warranty that every signature prior to his is valid. He's saying that Frank's signature is valid, that Anna's signature is valid, that Sally's signature is valid, and that my signature is valid. Does he actually know that? No. He wasn't around for most of those signatures. Maybe he was around when Frank endorsed the back of it, but he was not there for any of the other endorsements. How can he make that guarantee? How can he make that warranty? Well, it doesn't matter if he knows it or not. All that this says is that he is guaranteeing it. He's relying on the person he got it from, who was relying on the person they got it from, who was relying on the person they got it from, okay? His endorsement means that in, in, the, in the event that any of those signatures were a forgery and, they, and it doesn't fall under the, uh, uh, under the exceptions to forgery, that it would be, the, the document would be dishonored, okay? So George is guaranteeing that those signatures are valid. And if the bank is the one who ends up, you know, saying, hey, I lost a hundred bucks here, George, you got to give me my money back, then George has, has, has warrantied those signatures, so he would legally be responsible. Now, Frank gave it to George, and when Frank gave it to George, he made the exact same warranty. So if Frank ends up being charged back by his bank, Frank, George can go after Frank because Frank made the same guarantee. If, so now Frank is out the $100, he can go back to Anne Say, hey, you made the guarantees. So Anna would have to pay Frank. And then Anna would go after Sally and say, Sally, you guaranteed these signatures. So Sally would then go and, or excuse me, Anna would go after Sally and Sally would be left you know, holding the bag. She would be out the $100. They're all assuming that, you know, I guess we're assuming that my signature is the one that's forged at this point. Well, can Sally come back to me at this point? Well, no, because if I never signed the check, then I'm an innocent party here. So somebody in the middle, somebody who did an endorsement is going to end up being the person who loses the money. Okay. These, these warranties are here so that somebody will be responsible. Now, the majority, the great majority of checks or of negotiable instruments that go through the system are valid. 
without any forgeries, without any problems. That's why we don't, you know, that's why we have these warranties. That's why this whole part of the law exists because we want to make sure that these things can go through commerce. But when something bad happens, these warranties are out there so that somebody in that transaction will end up having to pay the money. Okay. Uh, the third warranty is that the instrument has not been altered. You know, that's another problem. You can alter the document. You know, we can have bad signatures. We can have forged signatures. But in addition to that, we can have altered documents. You know, if you're not very careful with the way that you write out your check, it's possible for somebody to look at it and go, oh, they left a little bit too much room between those two numbers there. And I think I can find the right color pen and I can stick another number in there. You know, it's not that easy to do, but it can be done. You can change the amount of the, uh, of the check or of the, uh, of the document. That's altering the document. Okay, so it was originally a check made for $7 and somebody put a zero after the seven to make it $70. And then if you go down where you write it out $7, and once again, if you're, if you're uh, too loose with the way you write those words out, somebody can add TY, $70 to make it, you know, that's an alteration, okay? Once again, you're guaranteeing that it hasn't been altered. Once again, the great, great, great majority of these things are not altered, but it does happen. And if it does happen, somebody's going to be responsible for it. Somebody in that line. Uh, the instrument is not subject to a defense or claim in recoupment of any party which can be uh, asserted against the warrantor. So there's no claim or, or uh, uh, defense out there. You, you know that that's one of the requirements of becoming the holder in due course anyhow. Um, for a with respect to any item drawn on a consumer account which does not bear a handwritten signature purporting to be the signature of the drawer that the purported drawer of the draft has authorized the issuance of the item in the amount for which the item is drawn um, when I was uh, an accountant um, one of the particular positions that I had was as an accounts payable accountant and I needed to write the checks <clears throat> to pay the vendors now I did it through a computer, we generated the checks and I would take a rubber stamp and I would stamp my boss's signature on each of the checks and then send them out, okay? So that didn't actually contain the actual signature of the drawer of the check, but I was authorized to do it. It was not that I was you know, doing any kind of fraud or forgery. But this particular uh, warranty is just saying that, you know, that that check was authorized and it will be uh, will be honored. Uh, the warrantor has no knowledge of any insolvency proceeding commenced with respect to the maker or acceptor. So there's no legal uh, in, uh, impediment in cashing the check. All right, those who present in, in an instrument for payment or the last party in line before the payor make three warranties. Uh, the warrantor is or was at the time the warrantor transferred the draft, the person entitled to enforce the draft or authorized to obtain payment or acceptance of the draft on behalf of the person. Once again, everything's been authorized. The draft has not been altered. Yeah, that's fine. And the warrantor has no knowledge that the signature of the drawer of the draft is unauthorized. Okay. Check this again. All right, what happens if it is not warranted? Um, let's see, do not guarantee that the payment of the instrument will be made. Similar, the, the holder's endorsement on a check does not give any warranty that the account of the drawer and the bank contains sufficient to, uh, funds to cover the check. Uh, implied warranties do, for example, promise the signatures on the instrument are not forged uh, and as nobody has altered it, Mm, no warranty of payment or solvency. So, da, 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 da. All right. So basically, the big one in there is that you're not warrantying that there's actually money in the account. All you're warrantying is that there's the value of the, uh, or excuse me, the uh, all of the transactions and all of the signatures and everything like that. The actual form of the document is proper. Um, you're not guaranteeing that there's actually any money in the account. Okay, da, 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 da. Let's see what else I have here. 
Yeah, we got through that a little quicker than I thought. Um, I'm not ending class right now, so don't don't disappear. Um, but are there any questions from any of you guys right now? Um, that really uh, uh, that was the the chapter on your responsibilities uh, on the transfer or the negotiation of a uh, negotiable instrument. If there's not any questions, I do want to start the next chapter, you know, because we, we, I think we're actually going to lose a class the way that the, uh, uh, the schedule goes this semester because of the way we delayed. Um, so I, I do want to try and pick up a little extra space here. So let me get the next, the next outline up for the next chapter. We'll get started, probably won't finish the chapter. Okay, so this chapter is chapter 29, liability of the parties under negotiable instruments. Okay, so we're gonna find out who is actually liable for what. Um, we saw just a few minutes ago, what the warranties that you're making are, but now if the warrant is, if, if something happens and the check or the uh, instrument is dishonored, um, what is going to be your actual liability under all of the terms? All right. Liabilities of the parties under negotiable instruments. Give me a second here. Okay. All right. So who are the people that are out there? You know, we've got uh, looking over the, uh, and I'll share this with you just because I can. Share. All right, here is the uh, outline for chapter 29. I have number one, the assignee being basically the holder. And then we're going to talk about the holder in due course. We were introduced to the holder in due course last uh, in the prior chapter. Uh, there are the four requirements to be a holder in due course. Give, uh, you gave value, took in good faith without not notice of honor or discharge without knowledge that it's overdue. Um, to become a holder in due course through a holder in due course is another issue. Um, defenses against payment of negotiable instrument. There are limited defenses and universal defenses. We'll talk about that. The Federal Trade Commission rule to deny holder in due course status in order to protect consumers. Um, this is an interesting rule. Uh, we've got primary parties and secondary parties, and then we'll talk about what dishonor of a check or dishonor of a negotiable instrument is. So that's the outline that we're working for right now. Um, let me get back to my material here. All right, so let's go through that. An assignee is a third party to whom uh, um, contract benefits are transferred. Now, remember, a, uh, a negotiable instrument is at its heart a contract. So an assignee is, uh, uh, is the generic term for somebody who has the rights of a contract assigned to them. And we did talk about that when we were talking about assigning rights and duties under a contract earlier last semester. But uh, we do have assignees here. And generally, that's going to be somebody that you are going to negotiate the document to. Holder, we talked about holder. Um, and that's generally who the assignee is going to be. It's going to be a holder. And then once again, this is someone who is in possession of an instrument that runs to that person, means that meaning that the paperwork, the language on it shows that that person has the right to hold that document. Either it's payable to them or it's a bearer paper and they actually have physical possession. All right. Holder in due course. Holder in due course. Now, the reason that we worry about whether you are a holder or a holder in due course is that eventually we're going to start talking about defenses against the instrument. Just like you would have had defenses against contracts last semester. Oh, no, I'm not going to pay because I didn't get delivery or, you know, whatever those things were. You didn't finish building the addition, so I'm not going to pay you. Those are defenses from having to pay the contract, right? Well, since a negotiable instrument is a contract, we can have defenses against a, uh, uh, a, a negotiable instrument. The key here is that some defenses are not valid 
against a holder in due course, meaning that if you can achieve the status of a holder in due course, you will have superior rights to regular holders. Okay, so becoming a holder in due course is an important thing. All right, a holder is a party in possession of an instrument that runs to him, runs to that party. Uh, a holder in due course, let me get the next page here. First off, you have to be a holder. And then secondly, you have to have done the, the four things that we talked about. So let's talk about them in, in, uh, in detail. Number one, you have to have, have given value. Now, if you think back to when we were talking about contracts last semester, in order for a contract to be valid, it had to be supported by consideration. This concept is very similar. Giving value as a holder in due course is very similar to the concept of consideration. Okay, so if I negotiate the document to you, it's a hundred dollar check and you give me a hundred dollars for it. Is there any question that you gave me value? No, there's no question that you gave me value. Okay, but what happens if it's not a hundred dollars? What if I get, you know, that I had written the check to Sally for a hundred dollars and Sally instead of maybe she doesn't have a family that she can go to to cash that check for her she goes to one of these check cashing places you know they exist where you can take a check in and they'll cash just about any check but they charge you a fee to, ch to cash that check so i give sally the check for a hundred dollars she takes it to one of these check cashing places and they give her eighty dollars eighty dollars for it okay is that value yeah, it is value. You could make the argument that, you know, that it's less value, but they're charging for a service. Once again, you can talk and, and, and consider whether that's an uh, uh, un unconscionable type thing that they're doing. But my cough is really bad. Um, they, she did give value. Okay, so value means that you gave something of value, or you, generally it should be cash because we're talking about you know a negotiable instrument that represents cash. Um, so you're giving that back. Okay, so value uh, it doesn't have to be the exact same amount, um, but it should be something that shows you know that it's pretty close to the to the real value. Good faith is the second element. The absence of knowledge of any defect or problems, a pure heart and an empty head, according to some people. Okay. So, what you have to have is an absence of knowledge of any defect or problem. Now, this becomes an interesting concept. It's uh, sort of above the pay grade of what we're doing here, but I will tell you this that knowledge, uh, the way that we look at it under the law, is more than just believing something. It's proving something, okay? Knowledge means that you've proved a particular fact, okay? So you may have an inkling that, oh, this check may not cash. I'm a little bit concerned about it, but that's not knowledge. That's concern. That's a feeling, but that's not knowledge. Knowledge means that it's been proved, Okay, so good faith. All right, I believe it's a good check. I really do believe it's a good check. Bad faith is the opposite of that. That means that you know that there's something wrong. You have specific legal knowledge that there's something wrong with the check and you're trying to pass it. Okay, so that's different. Okay, you took it in good faith. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that. For ignorance of defenses and adverse claims, um, ignorance of the instrument being overdue or dishonored, that's part of uh, good faith. You don't, you know, ignorance just means you don't have any knowledge. It doesn't mean you're stupid. This means you don't have any knowledge. So ignorance of it being overdue or dishonored. If the check 
one of the things that happens in the real world, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but if you pass a check that your that your bank dishonors, uh, it comes back with a big rubber ink stamp on it that says NSF dishonored, not not sufficient funds dishonored. So it's not easy to miss. So if you've got a check that has already been dishonored and you're trying to negotiate it, it's going to be hard for you to, to make yourself be a holder in due course because it's marked. The check is marked as having been dishonored. If it's overdue, you know, that would be more of a promissory note type thing. And remember, promissory notes are negotiable. But if you look at the note and it was due to be paid a month ago, it's overdue. Right, that's something you should be able to see on the document itself. So if you see that it's either been dishonored, it's got a big NSF stamped on it, or that it should have been paid at some prior date to where you are in time, then you aren't gonna have the good faith going for you. And so you're not going to become a holder in due course. Uh, ignorance of defenses and adverse claims. Once again, uh, if you don't have any knowledge, if you're ignorant of the fact that somebody's going to, to uh, have a defense further down the road, um, then you, you, know, you, you are a holder in due course. Um, one of the interesting things that can happen is that you can become a holder in due course without meeting some of those requirements if you take from someone who is a holder in due course. Okay, definition here, a holder in due course through a holder in due course. Uh, is the holder of an instrument who attains holder in due course status because a holder in due course has held it previously to him or her. And they give an example here. Okay. For example, a person who requires an instrument as an inheritance from an estate does not give value. So therefore is missing one of the requirements for becoming a holder in due course. However, if the person that they inherited the interest or the uh, instrument from was a holder in due course, then you will be a holder in due course. So you inherit something from your grandfather. Your grandfather dies, and we know that uh, one of the negotiable instruments that's out there is a certificate of deposit. So you inherit the certificate of deposit. Was your, your grandfather a holder in due course? Well, you know, was it negotiated to him? Did he take it in good faith? Did he give value? Is he ignorant of any defenses? It wasn't as it's not uh, overdue, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he was a holder in due course. Well, you inherit it from him. So you obtain the instrument from a holder in due course. So therefore, you are a holder in due course. All right. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now, even though this is a little bit early for stopping this class, um, because the next thing in here are going to be the defenses against a uh, uh, a negotiable instrument, and we're going to talk about the special uh, status of a holder in due course. Uh, under the defenses here, because some defenses are available against everybody, including a holder in due course, whereas some defenses are only available uh, against plain holders, but not available against a holder in due course. So I don't want to uh, get too involved in that because that's a pretty long piece and I don't want to have to stop. Um, are there any questions about today's class? No questions? Um, as I said, I did post uh, what I did was I took the uh, the uh, the video, the recording of uh, the last class, and I converted it into a YouTube video and posted it out on YouTube. Um, I did post a link to that particular particular video on Moodle. Um, I, Moodle doesn't give me the opportunity to put things in Moodle that have tremendous memory issues. Um, so I couldn't put the, uh, the, the, the video itself on Moodle because it was too big, but I do have the link on Moodle so you can go to it. Planning on doing the exact same thing here with this class. Um, I have been recording it. I will convert it and eventually get it up on uh, YouTube and then put a link uh, on Moodle to the YouTube video. Um, 
So uh, as it stands right now, uh, I'm still in Pittsburgh. My son is still in the hospital. So I have every intention of continuing remote as of Tuesday. Um, I will keep you posted. Uh, if that changes, watch for an email from me. I don't anticipate that changing. Um, so uh, at least uh, the uh, once again, the sign in information that you have here is valid for continue if, as we continue forward. I made this a repeating uh, meeting. So um, if no questions, then we will see you guys on Tuesday uh, right here on uh, on Zoom. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Grace.